All right, so Judges chapter 21 is the last book, uh, the last chapter in the book of Judges. So um, every time I read this, this story in these three chapters, I get to the end here and I'm just like, you know, enough already. <laughs> I'm glad this story's over. You know, I mean, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So if you remember, you know, from Judges chapter 19, we're basically ending a story that started in Judges chapter 19, went through Judges chapter 20, and now it ends in Judges chapter 21. If you remember, you know, the Levite and his concubine, his Levite, you know, went to, um, you know, this city in Benjamin, and his concubine was, you know, killed by the Sodomites, by these murderers. They killed her, and he sends her, you know, body to all parts of Israel, and they basically declare war on this. They ask for them to turn over you know, the, the guilty parties, but Benjamin would not do it. So they go to war with the tribe of Benjamin, and basically, all not basically, but all of Benjamin is destroyed in the war in chapter 20, except for these 600 men that are hiding up in the mountains or hiding up in the rock, Rimon. And now we're dealing with, in Judges chapter 21, we're seeing how the children of Israel dealt with these 600 men that remained. So keep in mind that, you know, they destroyed every single person in the tribe of Benjamin in this war except for these 600 men. Look down at verse number 1 and let's finish out Judges chapter 21 and then we'll kind of look back at the whole book of Judges and see what we can learn from that. But let's finish out this story first. In Judges chapter 21, verse 1, the Bible says, Now the men of Israel had sworn in Mitzpah, saying that there shall not any of us give his daughter unto Benjamin to wife. So basically, they had already made a pact. In if you go back to Judges chapter 20, look at verse number 1 there. And they met, they met in Mitzpah first. Then all the children of Israel, look at Judges chapter 20 and verse number 1, they made this pact. And they met in Mitzpah. The Bible says in Judges 20, verse 1, Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man, from Dan even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mitzpah. So we now learn that when they gathered together, before they went to the war, they made a pact. They swore, they swore an oath, so to speak. And the oath was that uh, they would not give any, they were going to go to war. It, it kind of gives you an idea that they knew what they were going to do when they went to Benjamin. But they said that, you know, when we go and we do this and we destroy Benjamin, we're not going to give any of our daughters to marry the men of Benjamin. Meaning they kind of knew that there was going to be need for them to marry somebody that they were going to destroy the entire tribe. Now look down at verse number 2 of Judges chapter 21, and let's continue. And the people, so we see the first pact or oath. And the people came to the house of God and abode there till even before God and lifted up their voices and wept sore. And this is now after it's over, okay? And said, O Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel that there should be today one tribe lacking in Israel? And it came to pass on the morrow that the people rose early and built there an altar and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Now, this is, I'm going to delve into a little bit of my opinion on this, but turn to Leviticus chapter 4. We see a couple things here. First of all, they're very upset that, you know, Benjamin is completely destroyed. And then we see that they're offering burnt offerings and peace offerings. Let's take a look at what those are in verse number 22 of Leviticus chapter 4. So this kind of gives us an idea of, you know, maybe what happened was not really the right thing. So look at verse 22 of Leviticus chapter 4. And the Bible says this, it says, when a ruler hath sinned and done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord his God concerning these things which he should not be done and is guilty, I want to look down at verse number 35, it goes through this big process of this sacrifice. And in verse 35, it says in Leviticus 4, 35, He shall take away all the fat thereof, as the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar, according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for his sin that he hath committed, and it shall be forgiven him. So this peace offering is to atone, especially in Leviticus chapter 4, um, verse 22, is to atone for the sin of a ruler 
of someone who's in charge. It's why they would give a peace offering. So, look, there's a strong indication here that they went overboard with the tribe of Benjamin. That's, that's all I'm really getting at here. Is a strong indication that maybe they weren't supposed to kill every single person in every single city in the tribe of Benjamin. You know, yes, God said, go up against Benjamin, fight against Benjamin, fight against these men, but they went into these cities. I mean, just imagine this for a minute. They fought the army, they beat the army, except for these 600 men, but then they went and they destroyed every city in Benjamin, killing every man, woman, and child in those cities. So there's a strong indication, and it's my opinion, that they went a little overboard here. And they, they, you can see that they repented themselves. They're offering peace offerings, saying, you know, they're lamenting the fact that, oh, what have we done? What have we done? We've destroyed um, all the whole entire tribe. They're like, now there's one less tribe in Israel, is what they're saying. Look at verse 5 of Judges 21. And the Bible says in verse 5, And the children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel that came not up with the congregation uh, unto the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning him that came not up to the Lord Mitzvah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. So here's the second oath, first of all. So first of all, what do we see in Judges 21? We see that, you know, there's, there's some remorse here for what they've done to the entire tribe. And number two, now they're figure, trying to figure out what to do with these 600 men. They all made an oath at the very beginning before they even went to war. They made an oath that nobody's going to give a daughter to the man of Benjamin to marry. Now there's no one for them to marry because everybody's dead. Every man, woman, and child in Benjamin is dead. So now they're like, what do we do? What do we do? And they're like, hey, remember that other oath we made? They made another oath. In verse 5, it talks about this oath that they made. That, hey, anybody that doesn't join us in this war, we're going to kill them. We're going to put them to death. So they made all kinds of oaths here. Just note that, okay? Look at verse 6. And the children of Israel repented them for Benjamin, their brother. Uh, once again, I mean, they didn't, it doesn't say repent of your sins. I get it. But they're having a change of mind about what's happened here. Okay? They're, they're you know, thinking, okay, you know, maybe we shouldn't have killed everybody. Right? So, um, and said, there is none, there's one tribe cut off from Israel this day. How shall we do for wise for them that remain? Now they have compassion towards these 600 men all of a sudden, seeing that we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them of our daughters to wives. So they made an oath. There's that oath again. And they said, What one is there of the tribes of Israel that came not up to Mitzvah to the Lord? So now they made an oath, and they made, an, they made two oaths, and they're going to fix the problem with these two oaths that they made. You know, it makes sense, right? They're like, hey, we made these two oaths, and they kind of match, right? So they said... What one is there of the tribes of Israel that came not up to Mitzvah to the Lord? And behold, there came none to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. This is a city. Okay, this is a city. For the people were numbered, and behold, there were none of the inhabitants, inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead there. So they go through, and they count up, you know, they do kind of a census, so to speak, of who went to the war, and they find that there was no one that came from this specific city, Jabesh Gilead, to go fight with them. Verse number 10. And the congregation sent thither 12,000 men of the valiant, valiantest and commanded them, saying, Go and smite the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, with the women and the children. So this is the town. They're going to go and they're going to, you know, kill everyone in this town. And this is the thing that you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every male and every woman that hath lain by a man. And they found among the inhabitants of Jehad Gilead 400 young virgins. So basically they said, you're going to go and you're going to kill every man, woman, and child except for the women that have never been with a man before. So there was these 400 um, virgins that had not known a man by lying with any male, and they brought them unto the camp to Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. So basically they made this oath they feel some remorse towards what they did to Benjamin, and they go and they slaughter everyone in this city, and then they kidnap and steal the women that they don't kill so they can give them to wives to the 600 men that they're feeling remorse towards. So you're just like, 
what <laughs> is going on here, right? So they, they keep trying to, and, and the irony of the whole thing is that they're trying to right a wrong. They're trying to, I mean, throughout all of, of Judges chapter 21, they're trying to right a wrong, and they just keep doing more wrong things, okay? And they're trying to cover up this wrong. We'll get to that in a minute, but look at verse... So, number one, they kidnap and steal these women. The problem is, if you know, you're doing the math on this whole thing, when you have 400 women and 600 men, you know, 200 men are coming up shy on a wife here, okay? So look at verse 13. And the whole congregation sent some to speak with the children of Benjamin that were in the rock rimmon, and to call peaceably unto them. And Benjamin came again at that time, and they were given them wives which they had saved alive, of the woman of Jabesh Gilead, and yet so they suffered them not, or su sufficed them, I'm sorry, they sufficed them not, because there were 600 men and there's only 400 women. So it's still not enough. So what must we do? We must fix this problem, they say. Look at verse 15. And the people repented them for Benjamin, because the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. Then the elders of the congregation said, how shall we do for the wives of them that remain, the 200, seeing the women are destroyed out of Benjamin? And they said, There must be an inheritance for them that be escaped of Benjamin, that a tribe be not destroyed out of Israel. How be it? So they asked the, you know, the elders, the, the leaders, the rulers, and they say, you know, here's what you should do. <laughs> They're wise men. Come up with another wonderful plan here. How be it we may not give them wives of our daughters? Why not? Because we made an oath, dummy. You know, you keep your oaths, right? Judges chapter 11, you don't go against oaths. Not in, not in this uh, nation anyway. Howbeit, we may not give them wives of our daughters, for the children of Israel have sworn, saying, Cursed be he that giveth wife to Benjamin. So they're bound by all these oaths. But look at Matthew chapter 5. Turn there real quickly. Look, another thing that we've learned in Judges is that, you know, the, these men in this nation, they were making oaths that, you know, they shouldn't have been making. They were making oaths that, that they were swearing by heaven and they were swearing um, to God and they were making these oaths that, you know, they were just, they were evil oaths, plain and simple. Look at Matthew chapter 5. This is why Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5. It's not that an oath on itself is bad. It's not that making a promise to God is a bad thing, but if you promise evil in God's name, you know, God doesn't want any part of that. That's what Jesus is getting at here in Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse 34. And this is just more example of this, these evil oaths in, in uh, Judges chapter 21. Look at Matthew 5, 34. Jesus says, But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst make one hair white or black. But let your communications be yea, yea, nay, nay. So Jesus is saying, just quit swearing all these oaths. But you say, why? Well, look at the last part of the verse. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. He's like, look, there's too much evil. He's, he, basically, Jesus is saying, you got all these people swearing, you know, to Jesus to do all this evil stuff. I wouldn't want any part of it either. I mean, he doesn't want any part of it. He doesn't want any part of you making an oath in God's name for something that is nothing that God would want you to do. God doesn't want you swearing and, and killing your daughter for, you know, in his name. Please, stop, is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, hey, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. That's it. Just do what you say you're going to do. And, you know, you don't have to go and just over the top swear all these things. Because what that is doing is that's just creating all these evil oaths. Judges is a perfect book to show this. Okay, and we see it again in Judges chapter 21. They swore this oath that they would not give any wives to Benjamin. Then they go and they slaughter everyone in Benjamin. Every female in the tribe of Benjamin was killed. And now, oh, but we made an oath. So, since we made the oath, let's go kidnap, uh, let's go murder a bunch more people, and let's kidnap uh, a bunch of women and steal them. 
So, look, the, the, the oath is causing them to do evil again. Okay? So, look, um, Jesus was just like, please, stop. <laughs> I mean, you know, he's watching men do this. You know, I mean, they swore an oath that caused them to kill the entire tribe, now steal a bunch of women from their own brothers, by the way. From their own, you know, Christian brothers. Jephthah is the same thing. An oath that led to evil. Go back to Judges chapter 21. So that's just a side note. You know, Judges is uh, really bad for uh, oaths in the Bible. But Jesus took care of that in Matthew chapter, 20, or Matthew chapter 5. Look at Judges chapter 21 and verse number 19. So now the elders, the elders, they have a plan. They have a plan to fix this missing, you know, gap of 200 wives. So there's 200 men that don't have wives. Look at Judges 21, 19. Then they said, Behold, there is a feast of the Lord in Shiloh, yearly in a place which is on the north side of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goeth up from Bethel to Shechem, and on the south of Lebanon. Therefore they commanded the children of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in wait in the vineyards. Saying, like, Go and hide in the vineyards, and see and behold if the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in dances, then you come out of the vineyards and catch you every man his wife of the daughters of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. So, I mean, that's one way to go. Here's what you guys can do. The elders, look, they had to, I mean, the, the leaders, all right? These are the best and the brightest of the nation of Israel at this point. And they have this problem where we've done this thing and there's no one for these 200 men to marry. Instead of just being like, hey, you know, maybe they shouldn't have been part of such an evil war. Maybe they should remain single for the rest of their life as their punishment. They're like, no, here's what you can do. You go, and, and once again, to their own brothers, their own nation. In their own nation, go to Shiloh and there's this, there's this barn dance or whatever it is. And, and all these gals come out, and all you got to do is just grab you one and go home to, to Benjamin. And that's literally what they said. Just go grab you one. Just, I mean, but, I mean it's not really funny. They went, literally went and stole, you know, 200 more women here. So look, I mean, it, it's, uh, where, where are we at here? Verse 23. And then, then they did it. Then they did it. So, look, and the children of Benjamin did so and took them wives according to their number of them that danced whom they caught. And they went and returned unto their inheritance and repaired the cities and dwelt in them. So look, oh no, verse 22, I didn't even say. So he's like, look, when their fathers of their brethren come to us to complain. I mean, look, do you think? You think that someone's going to complain? Uh, you stole, you know, these wicked men from Benjamin that, you know, you all of a sudden sided with. You were at war with them like five minutes ago, and then you encouraged them to come to my town and steal my daughter? I mean, you think they're going to complain? We will say unto them, be favor unto them for our sakes, because we reserve not to each man his wife in the war. Look, look, we're, what we'll say is, they, like, look, I'm sorry, but we forgot about their wives and we killed them all. You know, that's going to make them feel better. So, so because we killed their wives in the war, we decided that the best uh, plan of action was to have them steal your daughter. You know, it's just like, it just gets weirder and weirder and weirder in Judges chapter 21. That's why I, get, I, always, I always get to the end of this story, and I'm just like, man, I'm glad this story's over. <laughs> you know, until, I, until I read the Bible again, Judges chapter 19, 20, and 21. But look, uh, verse 23. And the children of Benjamin did so, and they took them wives according to their number. Verse 24, And the children of Israel departed thence at that time, every man to his tribe and to his family, and they went out from thence, every man to his inheritance. And then verse 25. Here we go. Verse 25 kind of puts a bow on the whole thing. And it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Instead, you know, I mean, can you imagine why the children of Israel looked, were, were asking for a king? I mean, these were the elders. These were the elders that they had. You know, this is the rocket surgeons that they had running, you know, the country at this point. You know, just going, you know, uh, you know what, we're in Fresno here. Uh, uh, there's a problem with uh, not enough women in Fresno. Go steal some from Visalia. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense what, what's going on here. It was, it was one decision, one bad decision, led to another bad decision, led to another bad... Look, it shows you, by the way, it shows you, not the point of the sermon, but it shows you that covering sin 
with sin is never going to work out. You know, it's best, look, when you get, when you find yourself in sin, boy, I mean, I, I see this all the time. I see this all the time with people that just won't take responsibility for stuff. I don't know why it's so common. I don't know why it's so common when you mess something up to just take responsibility for it. Because, look, when you, when you, have, when you have sin, or you, I mean, I mean let's just, let's take something at work. And you're like, you've done something wrong. You've done something wrong. Look, just, just own it. Just, just own it. Just throw yourself on the grenade. You know, instead, you know, you start tossing grenades all over the place at other people. And then everyone's mad at you for tossing grenades at them. You know, over something that, you know, was mainly your fault. Look, covering sin with sin just never works. Just own it. Just own up. Just own up. Covering sin with sin is, is not going to work. It, it's, a, it's a great sermon topic. And another thing is, you know, swearing oaths to evil is a, is a huge thing in Judges. It, you know, don't swear oaths. Just let your nay be nay and your yea be yea, as Jesus says. But really, this evening, for the application on Judges chapter 21, and then I want to kind of wrap it up with the whole book of Judges, I really want to focus on this last verse. Here's, you know, just think about the timeline. Think about, let's just think back to the whole book, the whole study of Judges for a minute. Think about the timeline. Think about Othniel and Ehud and Deborah and Gideon and Jephthah and Samson. And then later Eli and, you know, the last judge, Samuel, you know, which we haven't talked about yet. But look, and then up to, that leads up to the first king of Israel, you know, King Saul. But look, what do you see again and again and again and again in Judges? You, what was this phrase that I kept pointing out for the first few chapters? You know, the chapter 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 when we started going through this. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Look, it was just this pattern that kept coming up again and again and again and again. And many times, turn back to Judges chapter 8, many times, let's look back at, at Gideon. You know, when Gideon died. But you think about, you know, as we're going through this in Judges, we see this, this rise and this fall, and this rise and this fall, and this rise and this fall. There's a definite cycle here. You don't have to be blind to not see it. But look at Judges chapter 8. Look at verse 33. Many times this cycle took place in just one generation. Just one generation. Or in the case of Judges chapter 8, verse 33, look at this. And it came to pass as soon as, underline those three words, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal-bareth their god. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side, which is those 300 men and Gideon. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubal, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had shown unto Israel. So look, with Gideon, I mean, think about it. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the best judge. You, you could make that argument pretty good. He, was, he, he went, he, he literally did what he was told. God raised him up. He went. God took away his entire, entire army. God took away his army. He said, no, I'm just going to give you this many. 300 men against thousands, against tens of thousands. And Gideon went, and he was victorious, and then he even calmed things down with his brethren when they wanted to come up and fight against him. I mean, it's a great story. Probably, probably the you know, best story of a godly judge in Judges. You could make that argument. But here's the thing. As soon as he was dead, as soon as he was dead, they turned away, just like that. And not only did they turn away, they forgot everything that Gideon had done for them. Uh, pretty much immediately. But, I mean, we just see the story again and again and again in Judges that it's not very long. 10, 20, 30 years, and they turn away from the Lord again. They turn away from the Lord. Look at Judges chapter 21 and verse 25 one more time. Look, I just want to point out something 
about the last verse in Judges. We see this nation turn against God again and again and again. And I'm going to read it for you one more time. In those days there was no king in Israel. And the last part of this sentence I want to read for you. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Look, Judges, it's us. It's us. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You read those words. Look, you think it's an accident that you read the most messed up story in the entire Bible and then you read those words right after? That's not an accident. The Bible is telling you, look, this is why this is so messed up. This is why this was a wicked, evil thing that happened in Judges 19 with wicked, evil people and then just all these wicked, evil things just kept happening because everyone was, was doing right. Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. There was no leadership. There was no leadership, and everyone was just doing whatever they felt was right. Those elders in Israel, hey, we feel like this is what you should do, man. Go steal you some women. I mean, everyone was just, look, that's pretty much, look, that's pretty much where we're at in this country. I mean, look, from, from the rampant perversion that's just, just being accepted and just growing and growing and growing in this country. You can't even say, you know, it's really one thing anymore. It's like all this unnaturalness that's just being accepted by everybody. All that general, just general immorality in the country. Look, and it's changing so quickly. Look, if you're older than 30, you know that it's changing very quickly. It makes, look, it makes me wonder it makes me wonder what this place is going to look like in 20 years. I mean, when you look at just what it, what it used to look like 15 years ago, what it used to look like 10 years ago, what it used to look like 20 years ago, I, I mean, I can't even imagine. But look, here's another thing that I want to point out. We're changing just as fast as the nation in Judges was changing throughout these chapters with the acceptance of everything, with the moral, just the general moral decline. But I want to point something out. Turn to Joel chapter 3. Right after Daniel, you're going to have a couple small books and you'll have Joel. You'll have Hosea and Joel. But I want to, I want to point out something. I want to point out there's something that we need to understand from Judges and from these patterns. Like I love recognizing patterns. I love looking for trends and patterns and things like that. And, and look, there's a pattern that we need to understand because it's coming to us. We can already see it, but the pattern I want to show you is this. Look at Joel chapter 3 and verse 19. The point I'm trying to make here, and I want to define a word for you this evening, is that with all this moral decline and all this acceptance of everything and all this doing what is right in our own eyes in our country, with that will always come violence. With that will always come violence. You say, what is violence? What do you mean, violence? Well, I'm going to tell you what violence is. With every single story, when the children of Israel turned against God and turned against the country, and especially in Judges 19, Judges 20, and Judges 21, you know what you saw? You saw a whole lot of violence. Look at jo Joel chapter 3 and verse 19. This is the definition of violence. Look, violence, violence is not defined as anyone doing physical harm to anybody. That is not what the Bible defines violence as. Joel chapter 3 and verse 19 gives us a very specific definition of violence. Look what it says in, in verse 19. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah. Now, you know, the nice thing about it is it defines it in this next part of the sentence right here. Well, the violence, oh, okay, violence, what, what do you mean? Because they have shed innocent blood in their land. Violence is harm against the innocent. That's why abortion is so violent. That's why the, the sermon that I did on abortion, you know what it was called? Violence. Because there is no more definition, there is no better definition of violence, there is no more innocent person than a poor, helpless, unborn human being. That is the definition of violence in its purest form in this world today, is abortion. But that's not even what I'm talking about. What I am talking about, I want you to think of it. Think of the, think of the violence that we've just studied 
in, think of what happened to the Levite's wife. Violence. She was innocent and she was murdered in a horrible way. Think of the violence against the, the women and children in the cities of Benjamin. Think of, they, look, they had, no, they had no say in whether or not you know, these men were protected or not. They weren't even in the same city. Think of the violence there. Think, think of the violence of you know, being kidnapped and stolen from your family. These, these women. Just think about all the violence. Especially, look, you know what? You know who suffers from violence? You know who always suffers from the violence? You know, you know it's the weaker people. The weaker, oh, what's the, uh, the weaker vessel? They typically suffer from the most violence, whether there's wars or just terrible things happening. Look, it's the women and children that suffer. Look, men going to war, men, two men on a battlefield fighting in a war, it might be an unjust war, but it's not considered violence, two, two soldiers against each other. That is not what the Bible would consider violence. Violence is when the soldier goes into a city and murders innocent people. That is violence. And that is what the Bible is talking about. But I want to tell you something here, that when these nations, when these nations turn against God, and you'll see it with not only the nation of Israel, but you'll see it throughout history, whenever there's moral decline, and people turn against the God, and people, people start to do what is right in their own eyes, there's always massive violence that follows. I mean, look, I mean, we see it, we see it in Judges, right? Didn't we see it, I mean, didn't we see it before the flood? Why did God destroy the whole earth? Because of violence. We saw it with Benjamin. We saw it with the other tribes. Murdering, kidnapping, women, children. Extreme violence. Look, I'm telling you, our society is going to get more and more violent. You say, what? I mean, look, I don't want it. I don't want violence. But I'm telling you. I'm just telling you so you won't be offended. These school shootings, this mass murder, all this evil violence is going to get worse. Why? Because we're just doing what's right in our own eyes. We're not following the Bible. We've turned our back on God. The bombings, there's going to be more. I mean, look, as everyone, turn to Jeremiah chapter 6. As everyone does that that is right in his own eyes, violence will increase. Why, why can't people get this through their head? I mean, you don't have to be a saved Christian to say, you know what, I don't think that this is a good idea. Right. You know what, I don't think that this is a good idea that we enter into a society that's going to be more and more violent. I mean, who in the world would agree to that? Even the most liberal hippie would, would not want more violence, but this is what they, it leads to. Right. is you turn away from God and everybody does what they feel is right, this society is going to get more violent. I mean, the Bible is super clear about this. Look at Jeremiah 6 and verse 13. But they say this. They say this. When they say, no, 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 we need to do more. We need to make up more what, what's right in our own eyes. We need to go more down this road. We need to be more, you know, just accepting of everything. And just whatever, whatever you feel, man, that's what's right. Look at Jeremiah 6, 13. For, for the... Them, for from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. So here, I mean, here's the sin that's coming in. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. So we got a sin. We got a society, look, that's falling into some sin here in verse 13. Covetousness and basically cheating each other. So they're, they're cheating each other. I mean, it's a sin, right? I mean, they're going into this sin. They have also healed, verse 14, they have healed also the hurt of thy daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. You know what came upon these people in verse 13? Violence. And the whole time that they just kept going into sin and just, you know, ripping each other off and whatever other sin that they were into, they were just like, oh, peace, peace. Sound familiar? Yeah. Like, oh, peace, peace. Love, love. As things just keep getting more violent and more violent and more violent. Look at some of these riots. Does that look like love to you? I mean, what in the world? I mean, what, you know, look, it starts with covetousness, but it's acceptance and spreading of sin is what it is in the society. And it just, look, it destroys peace. That's what Jeremiah is saying. 
He's like, this kind of action from a society will destroy peace. Look, they say tolerance, but there is no tolerance. That's why churches get bombed. I mean, are you crazy? You have to be insane not to see this. Tolerance, give me a break. It's, it's a lie. As we continue down this road, the violence is coming. Who wants violence? Nobody. We want peace. Let's follow God's word. Let's do things God's way. And then things, you know what? Then things will get better. Things will not mean. How, how, how can you? How, how can we not persuade people? I mean, do you, more of, hey, hey, Bob. You know, Bob doesn't go to church. Bob's not saved. Bob. More violence or less violence? Pick one. I mean, everybody would choose less violence. Peaceful society, violent society. Everybody would choose peaceful society. But you know what? Even the unsaved, even the average unsaved Joe has no knowledge of the Bible anymore. That, that's a problem. That's a problem. You know what? Because there used to be a time when maybe there was people that weren't saved, but they knew what the Bible said. They knew what the Bible said. They knew what the Bible taught. They saw these patterns. They saw that, you know what? When a, when a society turns against God, violence and death. When a society turns towards God, peace, prosperity. I mean, it, you don't have to be a rocket surgeon to see this. You just have to, you, I mean, you have to have like a, like a, like a maybe a 140 level uh, knowledge of the Bible. You know, not, not 101, maybe a 140 or a 150 or a 160 level education of the Bible. We're not talking about PhD stuff here. Follow God, less violence. Don't, more violence. I mean, but we can see it happening, folks. There was another shooting today. We can see it happening. It's happening right before our very eyes. And they'll say, oh, it's the guns. No. It's, it's the violence. It's, 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 it's wickedness. It's, it's people that, that have turned against God. It's a, it's a nation that has turned against God. So look, violence will increase in our country. I, hate, I mean, I hate to break it to you. You know, is this the opposite of prosperity gospel or what? Yeah. Things are going to get more violent in our country. So, I mean, you've got to think about that. Think about that when it comes to, you know, defending your family, you know, security in churches, things like this. I mean, we cannot be stupid as Christians because we do know the Bible. But we're the same. The point I'm trying to make is we are the same as the nation in Judges in this sense. That these same things, these same patterns that we see, they're going to happen to us. So we're the same, but the next part I want to end with tonight is that we're different. You think it's bad, the first part, it gets worse. We're different. So it's the same in that sense that we're all doing what's right in our own eyes. But we're different in this sense. Here's a way it's not us. Here's a way that judges is not us. And it puts us at a significant disadvantage. Think about this. How many times, just in the book of Judges, there was many more judges that I'm sure we didn't hear about in the book of Judges, but not in the book of Judges, but in history of Israel. But look, how many times did we read that they got corrected? God raised up a judge, freed them, they turned against God, then they went into captivity, there was violence. I mean, there's so much violence, they were hiding in the hills, they were hiding in the mountains, they were hiding in the rocks, the Bible said, several times. They wouldn't even go down and live in their cities because there's so much violence against them. Because these countries came in and just committed violence against them. But then God raised up another judge to deliver them. Anybody see any judges getting raised up around here? Anybody see any judges that got raised up 30 years ago, 20 years ago? Ronald Reagan? No. No. Look, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about some, some examples in the Bible. Turn to Daniel chapter 5. Because look, I mean, God was pretty, like he kept reaching out. You know what he was doing with the judges? He was reaching out to them. And he was pulling them. They turned back to him. And he was pulling them back. Because they turned again to him. And he pulled them back. And then they were under chastisement. And then he pulled them back again. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, a, man, what's that relationship? Kind of like a father and a, and a child. And a son. But you know that there were some nations, some empires, even in the Bible, that this was not the case. Look at Daniel chapter 5. I think about Babylon. I think about literal. I'm talking about literal Babylon in the Bible. 
Look at Daniel chapter 5. So I don't have time to read the whole story, but I just want to, you know, Daniel interprets this dream for um, Belshazzar, the, the new king after Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. And look at verse 23. And Daniel is explaining what this dream, this writing on the wall meant that he saw. In the meantime, this man is having a party and he's brought all the, the, uh, the, the goods from the house of God and he's getting drunk with all his friends using the, um, the, the dishes and the cups and everything from the house of God. Look at verse 23. But hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, Daniel's telling them, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver, of gold and brass and iron and wood and stone, which see not, nor hear not, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast now thou not glorified. Then was part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written, and this thing that was written was mine, mine, tekel, aparzan. And this, inter this is the interpretation of the thing. Mine, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, so he's all happy that he interpreted what happened here, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck, I made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Verse 30. In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. This empire was ended in one night. This empire was ended and Darius the Mede took the kingdom being about three score and two years old. Look, Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember Nebuchadnezzar, look, I think Nebuchadnezzar was saved. I think Nebuchadnezzar got saved. But Nebuchadnezzar was chastised. Remember, God gave him the heart of a beast and made him, you know, his hair and his nails. I mean, he basically took his, it made him go crazy in his mind. He was too lifted up and God beat him down, but then God brought him back. This guy, God just killed him. God just like, you're just done. Your nation's over now. Look at Revelation chapter 18. Here's end times Babylon. End times Babylon. Now, I, look, I don't know what end times Babylon is going to be. Maybe it's us. Maybe it's not. But look, here's the thing. We fit in the category whether or not we, we become that literal end times battle, Babylon. Look at Revelation 18. And look at verse number 2. So we see that there's nations. In Daniel chapter 5, the nation of Babylon, the empire of Babylon, was overthrown in one night. There was no judge to bring them back and then get them right. It was just, you're done. Just like that. And they were overthrown. Look at Revelation 18, verse number 2. This is end times Babylon. This is a prophecy of a city. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. It's fallen. It has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Saying, this nation exported all its filth throughout the entire world. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God, had rem God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled to her double." How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torrent, torment and sorrow give her. It's saying, look, as, as, as great as things were for her, make it that much tormentful for this city. For she has said in her heart, I sit a queen and I am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. This city, whatever this city is, is, is done in one hour. It says one day, and then it gets more specific. It says one hour. 
this city is done. So look, we see that there's this idea. Now look, I mean, as far as exporting filth, or I mean, how many of you been to a foreign country and see that, you know, they're basically like following our culture except they're 15 years behind? I mean, it's pitiful. It's pitiful that maybe a good country that, you know, has, you know, some Christian values at least would be, you know, trying to follow American pop culture. You know, trying to be, you know, accepting our music and our celebrity culture and all this garbage that we're just exporting across the world. But that's, that's the I mean, so it definitely fits us. But the point I'm really trying to make is that there are these nations that are not, they're just judged by God. They're not children of God, where God is going to bring them back. Where God is going to, you know, try to, you know, bring a judge and raise them and bring them back to Him like He did with the nation of Israel. These nations are just going to pay all at once. Just like Babylon did. And just like end times, Babylon is going to as well. So look, I think, I think we're in that category. I think we're in that category. But look, see, so it brings us to the conclusion of why, you know, why the judges, you know, they went into captivity. God raised the judge to save them. Us? Us? Think about this. They, did you hear what I just said? They went into captivity. And then God raised the judge to say. I mean, do you remember when we got invaded 15 years ago? And then um, the Russians took over? And then we, we got out of that captivity? No. It's never happened. We've never gone into captivity here. No one's invaded us. We've never been under servitude to, you know, I mean, yeah, we're going under servitude to our own government. I get it. I mean, that's not really the point. The point is, is that, that we don't fit the pattern of the nation of Israel here. You know, it, it's God is, God is, for some reason, God is not chastening us in the same way that, you know, we've never been invaded. We've never been taken over by a foreign country. Also, you know, also, look, there, there's no judges there's no judges being, I mean, we, could we use a judge? Amen. Could we use a godly leader in this country? Yeah. Where, where? 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 Where is one? No, I, I think it's almost like our nation is not his child. Right. Is kind of what I'm thinking. That's, good. That's kind of what it's looking like. Right. It's kind of like we're going to be more like a Rome. Yeah. You know, more like a, like a Babylon. Uh, you know, the judges were raised up to deliver Israel, folks. To bring the people back to the Lord. That's what they were, that's what they were there for. And they, the people had cried out to God for that before it happened. Maybe that's the problem. Because we haven't cried out to God. Look, we don't have judges today. We don't have judges today in this country. It's pretty much just us. It's pretty much just us. And instead of, you know, fighting, you know, you know, it's, you know, we just knock. We just knock one door at a time. And, you know, we're the only ones, it seems like sometimes, it's, we're the only ones doing anything. You know, I know there's more of us out there, but it seems like we're the only ones doing anything. You know, one, you know, that's, that's, that's our judgeship, if you want to think about it that way is just one door at a time, one soul at a time. That's, I mean, that's the only chance that I see. One church at a time. That's the only chance that I see for this country. I mean, look, I'm all about recalling, you know, the governor. I signed it four times or whatever. No, I didn't. That's probably going to, I signed it, right? But here's the thing. It, whatever. It, it, where, where's the judge that's going to take his place? There isn't one. I'm all for kicking them out. You know, that would make me feel good for five minutes. But there, it, ultimately, until the people turn back to the Lord, it'll do nothing. And, and, and that's what we do. We need more people. We need more time. We need more doors. That's what we're doing. You know, this is, this is our... You know, pray. Look, pray. Pray. That things don't, I mean, all you can really do, look, I'm not trying to depress you, but all you can really do is pray that, we know what's coming. All you can really do is pray that this violence comes slower. 
All you can do is pray for God to you know, grow this ministry. All you can do is pray for God to give us more time, to reach more people. Because, I mean, he, look, even if, you know, the more people we reach, the more this church grows, the more churches will be sent out, the more, you know, I mean, look, it's an exponential game if we play it right and we allow God, you know, to do what he can do. So, look, this is our judgeship, and, and just pray that we have more time and more laborers. That, that's really it. That's really it. I mean, we're, we're the judgeship here. We're the judgeship here. So don't go and read the Bible like I used to do about the children of Israel and just roll your eyes at these people. Because we are worse. We are worse. We, we change just as fast. We're worse. We're bastards and not sons in, in this nation. And look, I mean, honestly, people have not changed from the beginning. I don't know how God deals with it. God is the most long-suffering, uh, you know, he, he, his long-suffering, I can't even fathom it. He's been watching this pattern since the beginning of the world. The fact that he hasn't just... and just ended it all and just put revelation into motion is, is beyond me. But look, the reason that he's not is because he wants, you know, it's God's will that all be saved. Amen. And, and that's why we are so important, Amen. is that we're carrying out this mission. We're carrying out this mission in this wicked environment that we're in. All right, and I, like I said before, it's pretty simple being us, because no matter what changes, our mission is the same. No matter what weird stuff gets going on or what they say should be good and shouldn't be and whatever is, is good in their own eyes, our eyes are the same and our mission doesn't change. That, I mean, that's our judgeship. So the book of Judges has a lot of similarities for us in, in this idea that we're just creating our own truth in this country and we can take from that the consequences that are going to come with it. But we can also understand that, you know, we're not the nation of Israel and, and all we have is getting one person the gospel at a time. And that's, that, I mean, it's the only thing. It's the only thing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.